Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon, and this is chapter 19 on the heart. The heart is a muscular double pump. It has two functions. Um, it participates in the pulmonary circuit, so the right side of the heart will receive oxygen poor blood from the body and pumps that blood to the lungs. It also participates in the systemic circuit, so the left side will receive Reoxygenated or oxygenated blood from the lungs and will pump that blood throughout the rest of the body. So the heart has four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. The atria receive blood from the pulmonary and systemic circuits, and the ventricles are known as the pumping chambers of the heart. So here we see a figure of both. Um, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. We can see that on the right side of the heart, the blood is receiving oxygen poor or carbon dioxide rich blood from the body. Um, it'll enter the right side of the heart and then go to the right and left lungs where the blood will then become reoxygenated. We have gas exchange occurring when we breathe in oxygen and then breathe out all that carbon dioxide. The reoxygenated blood will then enter the left side of the heart where it will then be pumped to the rest of the body. So our receiving ch chambers are the atria. We have a right atrium and a left atrium. And then the pumping chambers are the ventricles. We have the right ventricle, which will pump blood to the lungs, and the left ventricle, which will pump blood to the rest of the body. So note the spelling, atria, A-T-R-I-A, is plural, whereas atrium is singular. So the location of the heart um, and its orienta orientation within the thorax, we know that um, Typically, a healthy heart will weigh about 250 to 350 grams, about the size of your fist, and it is the uh, largest organ of the mediastinum. Um, this, the location, is, of course, is between the lungs. We have structures um, within the lungs, which we'll talk, within the heart, which we'll talk about. We have the apex. The apex is that pointy part of the heart that lies to the left of the midline, and the exact location of the apex of the heart is the left fifth intercostal space midclavicular line. This is important to know, especially if you are going into a healthcare related field, because when we auscultate the heart, we want to listen to the apex of the heart, and this is where we'll put our stethoscope. Also, when you're doing EKGs, one of the limb leads will go um, where the apex is located. Again, the left fifth intercostal space midclavicular line. The base of the heart is the broad posterior surface of the heart and is made up of the right and left atrium. Um, also to note, the apex is actually part of the left ventricle, which we'll see on this next slide, um, the apex being part of the left ventricle there. So again, uh, the heart is located uh, anteriorly within the mediastinum between the right and left lungs, um, and grossly we can see here uh, the location of the heart within the chest, uh, within the, the thorax, so between the right lung and the left lung, and we can see some of the great vessels uh, that are either taking blood towards the heart or pumping blood away from the heart. Okay, so we here we actually see part of the superior vena cava, um, and then a little bit more posteriorly, we'll be able to see the aorta, which will take um, reoxygenated blood towards the rest of the body. And if you actually see this cutaway, they cut away part of uh, the ribs that are, make up the, thor the thorax. And here is the fifth rib, and the space below the fifth rib is the fifth intercostal space, again, where we can find the apex of the heart. The heart has four corners. Four corners has the heart. So we have the superior right corner of the heart. This is at the coastal cartilage of the third rib and sternum. The inferior right is at the coastal cartilage of the sixth rib lateral to the sternum. Um, 
superior left is at the coastal cartilage of the second rib lateral to the sternum and the inferior left again this is actually where the apex is this is the left fifth intercostal space at the mid clavicular line now the heart has some very important coverings um, we have the pericardium, which is made up of two primary layers. We have the fibrous pericardium, which is made up of a strong layer of dense connective tissue. And we have the serous pericardium formed from two layers. We have the parietal layer of the serous pericardium and the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Now, I give an example of imagine your fist punching a balloon and the balloon will kind of cover your entire fist. The layer of the balloon that is covering, that is actually um, adhering to your fist, that is known as the visceral layer. So whenever you hear the word viscera or visceral, think organ. So this is the layer that is strongly adhered to the organ. Then you have a space between the visceral layer and the outer parietal layer. Uh, the parietal layer actually um, being the outermost layer of the uh, serous pericardium. So if we see the next slide, we can take a look at the pericardium and the two layers. So we have a fibrous um, pericardium made up of dense connective tissue, which is attached to the outermost parietal layer of the serous pericardium. And we can see that it kind of folds over itself um, that forms that double layer. We have the space between the parietal layer and the uh, visceral layer of the serous pericardium that is the pericardial cavity which is actually filled with fluid allowing for um, expansion um, of the heart and also it coiling back um, so the serous uh, the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is actually uh, the same as the outermost covering of the heart wall which is the epicardium so the epicardium is also known as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. And here we can see that epicardium, the outermost layer of the heart wall. And then we have that middle muscular layer. Um, middle muscular layer made up of our cardiac muscle, the third type of muscle tissue that we talked about in um, the previous units. So that middle muscular layer is known as the myocardium. And then the innermost layer of the heart wall, this is the endocardium. Endo meaning inner, so the endocardium being the innermost layer of the heart wall. So the epicardium is that outer layer of the heart wall. It's also synonymous with the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. The myocardium consists of cardiac muscle. It is the middle, um, most thickest layer of the heart wall. This is where we have muscular contraction and relaxation occurring. Also helps regulate the contractional force of the heart or the heart rate. And this is where most myocardial infarctions occur. So myocardial infarction is actually um, due to cell death because um, either there was a blocked uh, coronary artery or blood supply going to the that middle muscular. So if that muscle is not receiving any oxygen, uh, it becomes damaged or may even die. And that is what a myocardial infarction is. Basically cutting off blood supply to that middle layer of the heart, causing a heart attack. Now the myocardium is... Um, the muscle of the myocardium is arranged in uh, circular and spiral patterns. The innermost layer being the endocardium. Uh, we, this is made up of endothelium resting on a layer of connective tissue. This is a region that lines the chambers of the heart, again lining the internal walls of the heart. And this is just a figure showing that circular and spiral arrangement of cardiac muscle bundles uh, within the myocardium. So we talked a little bit about the heart chambers. Again, we have two receiving chambers, which are the atria. So we have right and left atria. Singular, um, it is right atrium and left atrium. So these are the superior receiving chambers. Uh, either receiving 
deoxygenated blood from the rest of the body on the right, or oxygenated blood uh, coming from the lungs on the left. We then have our pumping chambers, the right and left ventricles, and these are the inferior chambers. These chambers are separ uh, separated by walls, and another name for wall is septum. So we have an interventricular septum, which is the wall between the right and left ventricles, and then we have the interatrial septum, which is the wall between the right and left atria. We also have external markings of the heart. Uh, we have the coronary sulcus. A sulcus is just a groove, and this coronary sulcus separates the atria from the ventricles. And it's also an important um, landmark because important blood vessels actually sit within the coronary sulcus, which we'll see in the next picture. Um, then we have the anterior interventricular sulcus. So this is a groove located anteriorly uh, between the two ventricles, the right and left ventricles. Again, uh, this groove being important um, uh, as a Locate the location of um, important blood vessels, and we have the posterior interventricular sulcus again, that groove located posteriorly between the right and left ventricles. So, this uh, figure shows the gross anatomy of the heart. So, first, we're going to talk about that coronary sulcus. So, the coronary sulcus um, is actually a groove or space, a depression between the right and left atria and the right and left ventricles. So within the coronary sulcus here anteriorly, we can actually see one of the major arteries of the heart, and that is the right coronary artery. The right coronary artery is a direct branch of the ascending aorta, giving blood supply to the heart, and will actually um, go around towards the posterior um, and form a, a ring um, surrounding the heart, separating the atria from the ventricles. Also in the uh, coronary sulcus on the left, you'll find branches of the left coronary artery here. Um, and with arteries, of course, we have accompanying veins. So we have very important blood vessels that do sit in the coronary sulcus, okay? So again, that coronary sulcus being that groove um, where a lot of or major blood vessels will, will sit and are located. Um, and then we talked about the interventricular sulcus. So the anterior interventricular sulcus is located here, again separating the right ventricle from the left ventricle, and we can see here the anterior interventricular artery, also known as the left anterior descending artery, or your LAD, because we know that it is a branch of the left coronary artery coming from the ascending aorta. So the left anterior descending artery, also known as the anterior interventricular artery, sits in that anterior interventricular sulcus. Okay, so again, the sulci being very important um, grooves or depressions that um, where you can find the location of important blood vessels of the heart. So the coronary sulcus, again, kind of um, circling the a superior portion of the heart separating the atria from the ventricles, and then your interventricular sulci or sulcus separating the two ventricles either anteriorly or posteriorly. So here on this figure we can see many important structures of the heart that we will get into. We have the right atrium and then this little dog-eared structure here. Um, this is the oracle of the right atrium. And we know the right atrium receives blood supply from three um, major veins. We have the superior vena cava located here, the inferior vena cava, and then posteriorly will be uh, the coronary sinus that drains deoxygenated blood from the heart. Don't confuse the coronary sinus with the coronary sulcus. The sulcus, again, being that groove or depression, whereas the coronary sinus is actually a major vein of the heart, draining deoxygenated blood from the heart um, and transporting that blood to the right atrium. And again, the right atrium is that first major chamber of the heart that receives all deoxygenated blood from the body. Uh, also anteriorly, we can see part of the pulmonary trunk which transports the deoxygenated blood coming from the right ventricle uh, to the right and left lungs via the pulmonary arteries. Uh, 
Um, and then we can also see kind of behind or posterior to the pulmonary trunk, uh, the aorta. The aorta, which is a major vessel that transports oxygenated blood from the left ventricle uh, to the rest of the body. And we have different parts of the aorta. We have the ascending aorta, the arch of the aorta, which will then become the descending or thoracic aorta. And we have major branches off of the aorta, which we'll talk about, which will give blood supply to uh, the head and neck, as well as the right and left upper limbs. And this structure is the ligamentum arteriosum, um, which used to be an open communication between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta in fetal life. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So those are some of the structures that we can see off of this uh, figure. We can also see a lot of uh, structures posteriorly. Uh, notably, we still have that coronary sulcus, that groove or depression uh, between the atria and the ventricles. Um, posteriorly, the um, great cardiac vein and all the other veins will drain into this coronary sinus, draining the deoxygenated blood from the heart, um, going towards the right atrium. Again, that right atrium is the uh, first major chamber of the heart that receives all deoxygenated blood, both from the body as well as from the heart itself. And the coronary sulcus, um, you'll also find uh, branches of the right coronary artery as well as the left coronary artery. And then posteriorly, we have that posterior interventricular sulcus. Um, and here you'll find the posterior interventricular artery. Um, this is also known as your PDA, not um, public displays of affection, but posterior descending artery, which is a branch of the right coronary artery. So the posterior descending artery, also known as the posterior interventricular artery, sits in the posterior interventricular sulcus. Also within that sulcus, uh, we can see the middle cardiac vein, which will drain deoxygenated blood uh, into the coronary sinus and then into the um, right atrium. Okay, so there's a lot of structures you can see posterior. You can also see um, the right and left pulmonary arteries, which will transport deoxygenated blood to the lungs. These arteries being the only arteries in the body containing deoxygenated blood, but again, it still fits the traditional definition of arteries, which um, are vessels that carry blood away from the heart. And then you will see um, the left and right pulmonary veins, which transport oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium, the left atrium uh, receiving all the oxygenated blood from the lungs. And again, uh, the pulmonary veins are the only veins in the body that carry oxygen rich um, blood, but still fit that definition, traditional definition of the veins, which are blood vessels that will carry blood towards the heart. You'll also see posteriorly part of the superior vena cava, as well as the inferior vena cava, um, and then the third vein or third vessel draining deoxygenated blood into the right atrium, which is the uh, coronary sinus. And then we can see uh, part of the arch of the aorta, as well as the three main branches of the arch of the aorta. So a lot of things that you can see posteriorly as well. The right atrium forms the right border of the heart. Um, again, this is that first receiving chamber on the right side. It receives all deoxygenated or oxygen poor blood from the systemic circuit or from the body. And these are the major vessels that will drain into the right atrium. We have the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. Within the right atrium, uh, it is lined with structures called the pectinate muscles. These are ridges inside the anterior of the right atrium. We then have a structure called the crista terminalis, which is a landmark used to locate the veins entering the right atrium. And then within the interatrial septum, we have a structure called the fossa ovalis. We talked about fossas in the last unit, fossas being depressions. Um, the fossa ovalis is actually a depression in the interatrial septum. It's actually a remnant of a hole that used to be located there, which is the foramen ovale. So in adult life, it's called the fossa ovalis. 
in fetal life, it is called the foramen ovale. And we know that foramen, again, are just, uh, it's just a fancy name for holes. So there actually used to be a hole between the right and left atrium, a communication between the right and left atrium where blood uh, would circulate through because in fetal life, the lungs are not working. So the uh, fetal circulation had to kind of bypass the lungs in order to um, transport blood uh, to the rest of the body. And one of those um, ways of transport is uh, the communication between the right atrium and left atrium, which is the hole known as the foramen ovale. Once the baby is born, this hole actually closes and becomes uh, the fossa ovalis. Okay, notice there is an S in ovalis and an S in fossa. So fossa ovalis is the correct term. And then you have the foramen ovale. Uh, e in foramen, E in ovale. Okay, so make sure you don't get the two spellings mixed up. The right ventricle receives blood from the right atrium. It has to, the blood has to pass through a valve. This is the right atrioventricular valve or the tricuspid valve. It's called the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps. Um, so from the right atrium, blood travels to the right ventricle and passes the tricuspid valve. And from the right ventricle, um, it will then be pumped into the pulmonary circuit via the pulmonary trunk. And we have structures, important structures within the right ventricle. The internal walls of the right ventricle are lined with muscles. And these muscles kind of look like shredded meat. So trabeculae, we know um, from the bone chapter, trabeculae means beams, whereas carne, uh, carne means meat or beef. I believe it just means meat. So these structures kind of look like beams of, of meat or, or shredded meat. We then have uh, papillary muscles. These papillary muscles during ventricular contraction are attached to chordae tendinae, which are also attached to the cusps of the tricuspid valve. And during ventricular contraction, the papillary muscles will pull on the carteries, chordae tendinae to close the valve. So there is no backflow or regurgitation of blood from the ventricle into the atria, or to the right atrium. Blood will flow actually forward towards the lungs. Um, but in order to get to the pulmonary trunk, the blood has to pass through another set of valves, and this is the pulmonary semilunar valve or the pulmonary valve. Semilunar because they, the shape of these valves look like half moons. And the pulmonary semilunar valves are located at the opening of uh, the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. Next we have the left atrium, which makes up the heart's posterior surface. The left atrium receives oxygen-rich blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins. Again, the pulmonary veins being the only veins in the body that have uh, oxygenated blood. The left atrium opens into the left ventricle through another valve. This is the left atrioventricular valve, also known as the bicuspid valve also known as the mitral valve. Again, the mitral valve because um, a pope's hat is also known as a mitre. So that's why um, the uh, left atrioventricular valve kind of looks like a pope's hat. So the mitral valve is another name for the left atrioventricular valve or the bicuspid valve. Um, in my opinion, pick one you can spell. The left ventricle forms the apex of the heart, again located in the left fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. Like the right ventricle, the we have structures in the internal walls of the left ventricle, such as the trabeculae carne, the papillary muscles attached to cords um, or thin strings called the chordae tendinae, again, that are attached to the cusps of the uh, left atrioventricular valve or mitral valve or bicuspid valve and during uh, ventricular contraction these papillary muscles will pull on the cords to close the valves to avoid uh, blood being uh, regurgitated or uh, the backflow of blood into the atrium. Um, the left ventricle is also a pumping chamber. It pumps blood through um, to, through to the systemic circuit 
uh, via the aorta, but of course it has to go through another set of valves. This is uh, the aortic semilunar valves or aortic valve. Again, a semilunar because they look like half moons. So on this next slide, we can see the internal uh, gross anatomy of the heart if we do a coronal or frontal section. So we see the right atrium uh, being that first receiving chamber on the right, um, which will receive blood, deoxygenated blood from the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, as well as the coronary sinus. Um, we can see this uh, depression here. Uh, the fossa ovalis, which is a remnant of the fetal structure, the foramen ovale. So it's uh, a depression be within the interatrial septum or wall that separates the right atrium from the left atrium. Blood will then travel to the right ventricle, but it has to go through the tricuspid valve. And here we see the papillary muscles attached to those chordae tendinae, which are attached to the cusp of the tricuspid valve um, that will pull that valve closed during ventricular contraction, also known as systole. Also within the ventricle, we can see the sort of the um, shredded meat or beams of meat structures in the uh, lining the internal wall. These are the trabeculae carnae. Um, and then we see the wall that separates the right and left ventricle, this is the interventricular septum. So from the right ventricle, it will travel to the pulmonary trunk, but first it has to pass through the pulmonary semilunar valves, also known as the uh, pulmonary valve. Blood will then flow to the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk will bifurcate into the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. Again, these arteries being the only arteries in the body that carry deoxygenated blood, but fit the definition of an artery, meaning that they allow for transport of blood away from the heart. So from the right and left pulmonary arteries, the deoxygenated blood will go to the lungs where we'll have gas exchange and reoxygenation. Re and this oxygenated blood will then travel back to the heart via the right and left pulmonary veins. Again, these veins being the only veins in the body that have oxygenated blood, but fit the traditional uh, definition of veins in which they carry blood towards um, or away from, I'm sorry, towards the heart. So pulmonary veins uh, allow for transport of reoxygenated blood back towards the heart, um, will enter the left atrium from the left atrium the reoxygenated blood or oxygenated blood will go through the mitral or bicuspid valve also known as the left atrioventricular valve into the left ventricle um, again we can see those papillary muscles with the chordae tendinae as attached to the cusp of the um, mitral or bicuspid valve we can see the chordae or the trabeculae uh, the trabeculae carnae those um, structures that make up the inner lining of the right and left ventricles. Um, important to note, notice the thickness of the left ventricle. We can see that the walls of the left ventricle are a lot thicker compared to the walls of the right ventricle. And we know um, that the left ventricle is actually a lot more muscular because it has to pump blood a lot um, at a greater distance. It pumps blood to the rest of the body whereas the right ventricle actually only pumps blood to the lungs, and that's not very far to go. So the left ventricle, um, you can definitely differentiate because of the thickness of its walls. Okay, so from the left ventricle, blood will pass through the aortic semilunar valves into the ascending aorta. Um, the ascending aorta, we'll find, has um, branches that deliver oxygenated blood to the heart, we have the right and left coronary arteries, uh, which we will see um, later on in the uh, in the units. And then from the ascending aorta, uh, the aorta will then become the arch of the aorta, where we'll have three very important branches that will give blood supply to the right and left side of the head and neck, as well as the right and left upper limbs. And then from the arch, the aorta will then become the descending or thoracic aorta, giving blood supply to the thorax. So those are some um, 
important structures that we can see on this slide and then we talked about the posterior structures earlier so again here's just another picture of the posterior surface of the heart so let's talk about the heart valves so we know we have um, two distinct types of valves we have the valves separating the atria and the, ve the ventricles these are the atrioventricular valves or the AV valves now, before we get into that, each valve is composed of uh, endocardium with con a connective tissue core. So the AV valves uh, are valves between the atria and the ventricles. On the right, we have the right atrioventricular valve, also known as the tricuspid valve. On the left, we have the left atrioventricular valve, also known as the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve. And then we have... Uh, the valves that are located at the junction of the ventricles and the great arteries. So um, we have the aortic semilunar valve or the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve or the pulmonary semilunar valves. The pulmonary semilunar valves um, formed uh, between the junction of the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk and the aortic semilunar valve or the aortic valve found uh, at the junction between the left ventricle and the uh, first part of the aorta which is the ascending aorta now the cardiac skeleton um, this structure surrounds all four valves and is composed of dense connective tissue uh, functions of the cardiac skeleton include um, anchoring the valve cusps preventing overdilation of the valve openings it's also the main point of insertion for the cardiac muscle and blocks the direct spread of electrical impulses. When uh, you learn about the electro car, um, electrical activity of the heart, you'll you'll see that the um, the electrical current actually travels in a distinct path, and the uh, cardiac skeleton is a structure that will block direct spread of these electrical impulses for a reason. So here we see the different heart valves from a superior view. This is anterior, uh, this is posterior. So more, more anteriorly, the, we have the pulmonary semilunar valve or the pulmonary valve uh, between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. A little bit more posterior to that will be the aortic valve or aortic semilunar valve, uh, which is uh, located between the uh, left ventricle and the ascending aorta and then we have our two atrioventricular valves we have the tricuspid or right atrioventricular valve on the right we can see that there are indeed three cusps uh, giving it the tricuspid name and then we have the bicuspid or um, um, mitral valve with the two cusps uh, on the left also known as the left atrioventricular valve and these structures um, are attached to the cardiac skeleton and we can see the myocardium that middle muscular uh, kind of surrounding these structures as well so these next couple of slides will show you how the different valves within the heart kind of function to help move blood forward and prevent the backflow of blood so blood first returning to the heart fills the atria so on the right um, the right atria are filled with deoxygenated blood coming from those three vessels that we talked about, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. On the left, we have oxygenated blood uh, coming from the lungs via the pulmonary veins, filling up the left atrium. So blood fills the two atria, right and left, um, pressing against the atrioventricular valves, kind of increasing pressure as it is filling the as blood is filling the, the two atria. Once enough pressure has been reached, usually about five millimeters mercury, this pressure will force the valves, the AV valves, to open so that blood can be transported into the ventricles. Now, as the ventricles fill, the atrioventricular valves will remain open, so they, the flaps will hang limply into the ventricles. Now, once we have full contraction of the atria, um, this will force additional blood into the ventricles. So AV valves 
will open when atrial pressure is greater than ventricular pressure so that the blood can uh, move from that area of greater pressure to an area of uh, lower pressure. So now blood has filled the ventricles. Um, the ventricles, once they are filled with blood, they will contract. Um, this contraction will force blood against the atrioventricular cusps. Um, contraction also um, will allow for the papillary muscles, those structures that I showed you that are within the ventricular wall. The papillary muscles will also contract and tighten the chordae tendinae, those cords that are attached to the cusps of the AV valves. Um, so the chordae tendinae will tighten and prevent the valve flaps from uh, everting back into the atria. Um, so AV valves close, papillary muscles also contract, helping um, the AV valves to close. Uh, so once the AV valves are closed, the atrial pressure, when, since they are, uh, since the atria are no longer filled with blood, um, the atrial pressure will decrease, and then. Uh, because the blood has now gone into the ventricles, this volume increases ventricular pressure. So with contraction of the ventricles, um, the intraventricular pressure rises. So we have an increase in intraventricular pressure. Um, this pressure allows for blood to push up against the semilunar valves, which will force them open. So um, with uh, ventricular contraction, uh, this part of the cardiac cycle is also known as systole. The semilunar valves will open, which allows the blood to either travel to the pulmonary trunk on the right or the aorta on the left. So semilunar valves open, allowing for uh, blood to flow. And what after um, ventricular contraction has ended, the ventricles will start to relax. So as the ventricles relax, um, the intraventricular pressure will fall um, and allow for blood to uh, fill up the ventricles. So blood flows back from the arteries, filling the cusps of the semilunar valves, and um, blood that's kind of accumulating in this area will force the semilunar valves to close. So you can see these cusps, the semilunar cusps, um, filling up with blood that has been moved forward, um, allowing for them to close. Growing up, we've always um, known that the heart produces sounds that we can hear. Um, we, we know that we can hear those lub-dub sounds. And the lub-dub sounds are actually the sound, uh, the sounds of the valves in the heart closing. So the first sound, the lub sound, this represents the AV valves closing. And the AV valves close during ventricular contraction or systole. Now the second sound, that dub sound, uh, this is the sound of the semilunar valves closing. And the semilunar valves close during diastole, um, which allows for ventricular filling. So again, just a picture of the different valves of the heart. We see those semilunar valves, um, the pulmonary valve anteriorly compared to the aortic semilunar valve and then the right and left atrioventricular valves. So the um, tricuspid valve on the right with its three cusps and the bicuspid or module valve on the left. So each valve sound is actually best heard near a different heart corner. Um, the pulmonary valve is heard is best heard in the superior left corner. The aortic valve is best heard on the superior right corner. The mitral valve um, or bicuspid valve is best heard at the apex at that left fifth intercostal space midclavicular line. And the tricuspid valve can be found or can be auscultated or uh, heard at the inferior right corner. So here is actually a great um, depiction of where you'll hear uh, the different heart sounds. Um, a good way to remember where these sounds are located is apartment M. So A, P, T, 
apartment M. Okay, so we can hear, oops, let's go back. We can hear the aortic valve um, in the second intercostal space at the right sternal margin, the pulmonary valve in the second intercostal space at the left sternal margin, then the tricuspid valve uh, in the right sternal margin of the fifth intercostal space, and then the mitral valve found at the apex, which is the left fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. I can't draw a line. Um, so in the middle of the clavicle, down, and then in that fifth intercostal space. That is where you will best auscultate the mitral valve um, uh, at the apex of the heart. So it is very important to know the flow of blood, the pathway of blood through the heart. Um, you can first start off with the deoxygenated blood um, coming to the right side of the heart from the superior and inferior vena cava as well as the coronary sinus. Um, you will then need to describe the pathway through the pulmonary and systemic circuits as well as trace a drop of blood that passes through all the heart structures in order or sequentially. Um, know that the atria do contract at the same time together um, and then the ventricles also will contract um, at the same time together. So this figure actually shows you the path of uh, blood through the heart. So make sure you are comfortable, comfortable being able to describe the pathway of, uh, of blood through the heart. So let's start with uh, deoxygenated blood returning to the heart via those three major veins, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. So deoxygenated blood will enter the right side of the heart uh, through uh, the right atrium. So we can see blood here entering the right atrium. Um, it will then move through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Um, from the right ventricle, it will then pass into the pulmonary semilunar valve to the pulmonary trunk, where uh, the pulmonary trunk will then bifurcate into right and left uh, pulmonary arteries, which will then um, bring deoxygenated blood to the lungs. So oxygen poor blood is carried in the two pulmonary arteries to the lungs uh, via the pulmonary circuit, where uh, here at the capillary level, we have gas exchange so that this blood can become reoxygenated as oxygen comes into the lungs, carbon dioxide will be exhaled. So then this oxygen rich blood will return back to the heart through the four pulmonary veins uh, going to the left atrium. The blood will then flow through the mitral or bicuspid valve into the left ventricle and then from the left ventricle the blood will pass through the aortic semilunar valve to the ascending aorta um, and then to the aorta to the rest of the body and again we'll have that oxygen rich blood being delivered to uh, the rest of the body to the tissues via the systemic circuits and here we see that uh, gas exchange also occurring uh, within uh, the body uh, through the various capillaries. And then the cycle begins again with the oxygen poor blood returning back to the heart. So here is a figure showing you the flow of blood, uh, blue representing the deoxygenated or oxygen poor blood, or carbon dioxide rich blood, and the arrows showing you the um, flow of blood through uh, the different sides of the heart. So we see the deoxygenated blood entering the right side of the heart um, from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, then through the pulmonary semilunar valves up the pulmonary trunk to the right and left pulmonary arteries going to the right and left lung to get reoxygenated as well as uh, transport out carbon dioxide. So then this oxygen rich blood goes back to the left side of the heart via the four pulmonary veins on the right and the left. Uh, it enters the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, 
through the aortic valve to the ascending aorta, the arch of the aorta with the three branches, uh, then the rest of the body. So we know that the heart beats um, about 70 to 80 beats per minute at rest. During systole, which is uh, we consider a ventricular contraction, systole is contraction of a heart chamber. We have ventricular systole as well as atrial systole. Um, diastole is atrial or ventricular filling, so this is when uh, a chamber will expand and fill with blood. The systole and diastole also refer to the stage of the heartbeat when ventricles contract and expand. Normally, we can, we talk about ventricular systole and ventricular diastole, um, but know that the atria also go through their own systole and diastole as well. We looked at earlier the differences in wall thickness, especially with the ventricles, um, but between the atria and the ventricles. The atria, of course, have thinner walls uh, compared to the ventricles. Ventricles have thicker walls with the left ventricle having the most uh, thickest of all the walls, of the heart walls. Uh, we also know that the systemic circuit is longer than the pulmonary circuit and offers greater resistance to blood flow, which is why the left ventricle is a lot thicker. So the left ventricle is three times thicker than the right ventricle because it has to exert more pumping force. Uh, it will flatten the right ventricle into a crescent shape. So we can see in this next slide how uh, thick the uh, myocardium or the heart wall of the left ventricle is compared to the right. And we can see this crescent shape of the right ventricle. And then we have that wall between the two ventricles, the interventricular septum. So we talked about cardiac muscle tissue um, in the last unit. Cardiac muscle tissue forms the myocardium. We can see striations like skeletal muscle. However, unlike skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle actually uh, branches. Um, and we know that contractions uh, pump blood through the heart and into the blood vessels. And we talked about that sliding filament mechanism um, that explains contraction of muscle tissue. And just to review, cardiac muscle cells are short. They're branching, have one or two nuclei, whereas skeletal muscle is multinucleate. Um, and unlike skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle tissue is not uh, fused into colonies. We know that cardiac muscle tissue cells join at these structures called intercalated discs, which are complex junctions and form cellular networks. Uh, the cells are separated by uh, a delicate connective tissue called uh, endomesium, which binds adjacent cardiac fibers uh, and contains blood vessels and nerves. The structures that are um, very specific to cardiac muscle tissues, these intercalated discs are complex junctions. Um, basically how uh, this, uh, the cardiac muscle cells are able to communicate with one another. So um, at complex junctions, uh, we, adjacent sarcolemmas will interlock. Also possess three types of cell junctions. We have desmosomes, fascia adherens, these are long desmosome-like junctions, as well as gap junctions, and these structures allowing for uh, communications between cells. And here we see that typical picture of uh, cardiac muscle cell tissue um, underneath a microscope. We see these branching uh, striated cells. We see these dark intercalated discs uh, where the cells will interdigitate. And then um, between cells, we know that there are gap junctions that allow for communication between cells. We have uh, fascia adherens between cells. And then this is just a figure of uh, a typical cardiac muscle cell um, and the sarcomere as well as the uh, cell structures um, the organelles within the cell. We have, you know, our mitochondrion that produce the energy for the cell. We have our T-tubules, sarcoplasmic reticulum, allowing for the um, 
uh, transport of calcium to allow for contractions. We see our typical uh, sarcomere um, structures, our Z discs, and then our different bands of the thick and thin filaments. So we know that like skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle tissue is triggered to contract um, by the ion calcium entering the sarcoplasm. Um, this signals uh, the sarcoplasm reticulum to release calcium ions. These ions will diffuse into the sarcomeres and trigger that sliding filament mechanism allowing for contraction of the cardiac muscle cell. Now, not all cardiac cells are innervated. They can contract on their own, so will contract in a rhythmic manner without innervation. This is what's known as inherent rhythmicity, and this is the basis for rhythmic heartbeat. So we have specialized cells within the cardiac muscle that allows for it to beat on its own. Um, it will be under you know, sympathetic control, of course, but for the most part, cardiac muscle can uh, create its own electrical uh, uh, impulses um, and it is controlled by uh, specific cells which will be, we will get into when we talk about the conducting system of the heart and that will be in the next video because um, I'm going to divide this chapter into two parts so this is the end of part one chapter 19 on the heart